Welcome to All Things That Is with Garrett, and I'm Garrett. I'm finally back with another video for you guys. Uh, this was a Maxima Overdrive special screening in Wilmington, North Carolina, and that's at the Stone Theaters there in Wilmington. It was on September 19th. Uh, I'm not going to show you the whole movie. I'm just going to show you um, the Q&A afterwards. Uh, it's with a guy named Jock Brandis. He was the uh, did the lighting uh, on the movie. And he had, did, had a lot to do with uh, helping Stephen King uh, find the, find a lot of the uh, find the trucks and a lot of the other vehicles used in the movie. A uh, lot of a lot of cool a lot of cool information and a lot of trivia in the Q and A. There's a little introduction before. Uh, bear with me at the very beginning. I did a couple of videos leading up to it, uh, but this introduction. There's the end. There's an end screen or the in credits and then there's a then the post um the, the main q a is afterwards with jock and uh it's really interesting and then i ran out of space on my on my phone and then i just um but i got up with my friend chris from the midnight movie snack podcast and uh we i kind of tell him what the last couple questions were we talk about uh, at the very end of what the q a was about but I hope you enjoy. Look in the video description below. Uh, it's a long video. I realize that. And you may not want to, to uh, dress through the whole thing. But I will try to, after this is posted, I will look at the times and try to least, try to list the times of where certain things are. So if you're interested in hearing uh, just the Q&A, hearing, hearing about Jock talk about uh, how many uh, Green Goblins there are or about the but the lawnmower accident with uh, with the more, with, uh, with Armando or you know anything like that I'll try to list it kind of break it down and tell you what minute uh, and seconds it will be at so that way you can you can go straight to it uh, thank you for listening and uh, and for watching and, uh, and here we go this is all things A's with Garrett and I'm Garrett we're on location in Wilmington uh, we're at the Point uh, Theater uh, the Point 14 Wilmington uh, they're having a show in today at Maximum Overdrive it's a screening uh, Jack Brandis, who worked on the film, is going to have a little q and I don't know if it's before or afterwards, but uh, we're here just to let you kind of see. It's a nice little, uh, this is new to me since I've been uh, back in the Wilmington uh, area. I haven't been, so this is all uh, new. Was, this is not here when I lived here years ago, but uh, I'm going to go see, uh, getting in. It's a free ticket, but... Um, it's first come, first serve, so we'll see what happens. So, uh, yes, I'm definitely gonna be able to get in. Uh, there's availability. Uh, we gotta wait a few more minutes to go in, but just showing you who this the screen here, about who's gonna be there. Uh, okay, okay. Q&A following the screening, Jack Brandis. There's what he looks like. And 
in my little tweaky brain, I thought, so I go over to the security guy and say, ask them what the li where the license plate on this motorcycle is from. And they said, it's from Maine. So I went out there, and there is Stephen King on his motorcycle at the front gate. They're not letting him in. Because he doesn't have a pass, he doesn't have a whatever. And his explanation was, this is a movie about trucks gone mad, and he thought if he got on his bike and rode it all the way down I-95, he'd get to see a whole lot of very large, terrifying trucks. And he, and he was right, he did. <laughs> so the, the, uh, the meeting proceeded, and this was where it was discovered, for the first time I knew, was that Stephen King was going to be directing this movie. And Dino, uh, um, Dino said, of course, we have, it's the fifth picture in the, in the contract, and, and Mr. King will be directing, and Stephen says, I, I don't know how to direct a movie. I don't want to learn how to direct a movie. I can't do it. Get someone else. And there's this big stop in the meeting, and everyone looks around, and Dino, in his usual fashion, looks around the room, points at me, and says, oh, Mr. King, you do not know how to direct a movie? Well, Jock will show you how because he, has the most time. <laughs> because he has the most time. Now, I don't know if anyone's been on a movie set, but generally the lame guy doesn't have the most time. <laughs> you would get the makeup person. That's what I would do. You would get the makeup person to teach me how to direct. Okay, well, I think uh, there's going to be Q and A's afterwards, uh, and I'll be around. And, and all of you who are just coming here to see me die, I think that's around minute number seven or something. <laughs> Although I, I die in. I die in all the ones that I'm here in. I my two kids here in the audience, and they've collected a series, a series of shots of me dying. So <laughs> <laughs> for my funeral, they will stop the proceeding, and they can see me die in scanners. And die in deathbed. I die a lot. So that will lighten up the funeral a bit. All right? So I don't know. I think it's, it's a thing. Is it Michelle up in the booth? Uh, Marisa, Marisa. Uh, Marisa, Marisa up in the booth. I think uh, I've warned the audience up. You're here to get edgy. I think it's time for feature film. Woo! Enjoy. Thank you for being here. Thanks. 
going to buy trucks with Stephen King is a real trip because, first of all, he decided he did not want to be recognized as Stephen King, so he's, he wore this weird kind of stinky broom hat and a narrow lapel suit, and he shows up with sunglasses. He looks exactly like Dan Aykroyd in the Blues Brothers. <laughs> so now every, no one would recognize him before, but now everyone thinks he's, he's Dan Aykroyd. So, <laughs> so now we have to deal with that whole issue. Nothing is ever simple as Stephen King. But we would get into our rental Cadillac with a with a case of beer at 7:30 in the morning. We'd go find trucks, and we would put uh, we would put heavy metal on the tape deck at full blast. And he said that back in Bangor, Maine, he used to write all night long, and they had an AM station that ran all night that played requests, and they never played any of his requests because it was kind of mellow music at night. So he bought the station, turned it into the only. Um, stereo AM station in America, and he said that once they bought the station, they started playing his requests. So <laughs> he's, he's like a, he's a totally ACDC heavy metal guy, and I don't know who he must have really been involved with that because he was really into the music. Yes. Oh, it's it's, it's um, W Z O N in case anyone wants to hear it right through me. Oh, come on, there's got to be some question. Or do I have to just go on telling weird tales? How did they shoot that bridge scene without damaging? Oh, oh that's a great ah, question. Ah, the bridge. Repeat the question. Repeat the question. We, we, we attempted to make a duplicate bridge in a gravel pit somewhere here in, in North Carolina. So we made another bridge. The problem was, and I hope I'm not telling tales out of school, but. The effects crew that we got uh, proved to have gotten their job with a completely false resume. <laughs> they had no idea what they were doing. And when things started to go very badly, Marilyn Lightstone, who was a production manager, who I knew from Canada, pulled me over, and this is a woman who would have half a bottle of scotch before her first coffee break. <laughs> And she, she said, I'm taking you off the show right now. Go down to Blockbuster. Here's some money. Rent everything on this resume and see if you can find anyone's name on the resume. I, I, I'm credits. <laughs> and they, were, they, were, they didn't exist anywhere. So these guys really, so we made the bridge. And the bridge, as you recall, collapsed as soon as you put some load on it because they didn't realize that pillow bearings have a rated load for downward load, but not for a lift. So it, basically everything went very badly. And um, it was it was a kind of a joke until the cameraman was blinded in one eye by the lawnmower stuff that went awry. And then all of a sudden the complete incompetence of the of the crew, of the special effects crew became a, like a really serious issue. But at that point the production company wasn't willing to get rid of them because that would suggest that they were that they had not done due diligence to hire them and that would open them up to legal action so we had to suffer through these guys who wrote the show <laughs> so uh, it was all that stuff they did you know in retrospect you look at it and it looks better than you remember when we were on set every day was you know who, who's you know let's have a hat was a an ambulance standing by <laughs> so uh, but jack talk about the uh, foreground miniature is that uh, when it comes to the bridge the, the foreground miniature is uh, it's worth mentioning. Emilio Ruz. No. The, the, the foreground miniatures. Well, okay. Well, you just have to come up here. Well, actually, can I defer to uh, Mr. Schumacher? <coughs> Not wrong. Yes. Mr. Schumacher was doing foreground miniatures. Yeah. Thank you. Well, get, on, get on the microphone. Get on the microphone. <laughs> come up <out> here. <laughs> You were partially right with Amelia and Ruiz. The, uh, they kind of built the miniature. Hold it close to your mouth here. They kind of built the miniature, but uh, then he had to go off and do a film for Raphael in China. So, it all fell into my lap. <laughs> and as we were doing the, the scout to do it, they were planning on shooting it from a barge, not realizing we have tides here. So they could not, they could not shoot it on a barge because it would, it would vary at about six feet where we shot it at, depending on the time of day. So we had to, at the time, it was Dean Hardwoods who was there, 
there's there's now a pier there that we built and we had to do it on a pier in the foreground with the real bridge behind with models that Eric Skipper made and uh, that's kind of the way that went and the hydraulic set we did for this the smaller one because I was wanting to rub the plans for it um, that was a short section with hydraulics and uh, it really went as badly as Jock said. <laughs> <laughs> I must point out, you, you noticed me dying gracefully when I had a mustache in those days in Cyprus. Uh, <laughs> and they say something like, what the fuck, what the shit, what do I ever say? What, what is this shit? <laughs> that was my line. I, I sounded too Canadian, so they stuck me. <laughs>
I know. I look at this truck and it looks like it's smiling to me. We need a truck that frowns. And you turn to this poor salesman and say, do you have any trucks that frown? <laughs> <laughs> so the truck would get a little flush. It's got a, he said it's got a triple twist uh, Russian hemp seat covers and high tensile steel ashtray. You really should get this thing. She was like, you know, but I, I, it, was, it was the most disjoint, disjointed conversation any three people have ever had. And he was totally fine with that. But when we went hunting, we, we got lost on Camp Lejeune trying to find the military surplus yard for surplus vehicles. But we went to buy that little, you know, little mule platform with a machine gun. Yeah, it's a mule. There's a, there's a military name for those. You know what that is, Gene. Mule. A mule, right. It was a mule. And, uh, and we got lost and you know, around, you, you, you want to have a fun time, get lost in Camp Lejeune. Because <laughs> I remember we were driving in somewhere in the barracks area and coming, walking down the road is a woman in a, in a night coat and curlers carrying a vacuum cleaner with the hose dragging its way down there. And she's marching down the road like this dragging her vacuum cleaner with her hair, and she's just looking like, she would say, stop, stop. I want to hire that woman. I want that woman in my movie. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Stephen, we are now in an area with a large number of people who are trained to kill. <laughs> We've seen one half of a very unhappy domestic incident, and the other half is probably better half than the lady with the vacuum cleaner. So we should probably just, no, I want to cast her. I think she's great. Well, you know, at a certain point, we, you, you can't ignore the director at a certain point. Questions? How did you do the branding? The like branding? that thing on the side of the truck. Who wanted their branding on those trucks? Everyone wanted their branding on the trucks. <laughs> we just, there were, there were a, we had a lot of trucks. I mean, between the ones we rented and the ones we bought, we bought a lot of trucks and we tore up. Yeah, you, you, did you, you don't get, think did you get money from Vic? I'm sorry? Did you get money from Vic? No, we barely got money. <laughs> <laughs> did, did we get money? Yeah. Uh, from Vic? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, the gentleman up in the nosebleed section. Um, I was just curious how the Green Goblin was chosen as the face of the truck. <laughs> and were there any other faces you guys considered? I don't know. We had, oh, wait, wait, wait. Because we, we had Whoa. a fabulous, fabulous sculpture department. Right? Made up of a challenge. Can you just come down here and stay down here? Because, <laughs> you know, you got to realize that there are people who work the set, and then there are all these people who stay back in the air conditioned club <laughs> studio and drink cappuccinos at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And then some of us did both. Yeah. Anyway, um, Giorgio Postiglione, and uh, it was the production designer, and Stephen got together, and they came up with that. Giorgio gave me a quick drawing and said, find a sculptor to do this. So I had to do the various perspective drawings and then a local sculptor here did the, did the actual thing, the thing and then we molded it. We made four copies just because we knew we were gonna blow up, blow up the truck and we didn't know how many times we were gonna have to blow up the truck. <laughs> but the Happy Toys thing was because we couldn't get any, any sponsors so we had to kind of steal the Toys R Us idea, and uh, like, but the only the only company that actually gave us money to put their logo on, I don't know whether you saw it go around. It's at one point five. Yeah, that was the that was the job. One point five rolling papers. <laughs> <laughs> the rolling papers. They were the only ones no. who gave us money to put their logo on. <laughs> <laughs>
and that you want to talk about the four craziest guys in the world. There's Dino, there's um, Christopher Walken, <laughs> there's um, there's Stephen King, <laughs> and there's David Cronenberg. Oh. And you all get together in the middle of a Canadian winter and make a movie. And North Carolina looked pretty good after that. So. <laughs> anyway, he, somehow it was a decimal point error. Uh, Dino had given me a budget of nothing to do this, this accounting department. You were the gap. You were the gap on this. I was, I was doing lighting and all that stuff. I, was, you know, I had no money for things like gels and expendables and all those things you do. So I ended up mooching from other movies, and we did it for no money. And I'm doing my last little petty cash turn in, grudgingly so. And while I'm at the accounting department, in comes Mr. Galanda, the Dale Randis, who I've never met before. He says, I hear, here you are here. I want to meet the man who makes the movies for no money. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, well, you know, you give me no money. I said, you give me $1,500, and that's all I have. He says, $1,500, we give you $15,000. And so somehow the decimal point. <laughs> and that's why I did it for no money. And he was so impressed that he brought me down to North Carolina to teach the boys to make the movies for no money. <laughs> but one of the fun things just before this, and I think Gene remembers that there, Gene Poole. In the big Gene center. Poole! and the, the key lighting guy and Rip all spoke Italian. And somehow Dino thought I spoke Italian. I don't know how. And I had to give Italian speech lessons to all the guys we had hired from Shelby who came down to make movies. <laughs> you know, with their own be. So you'd see us in front of the lighting grip shop with me up there teaching these guys from Shelby how to speak Italian, which was more fun than ever. So he was like, all right, everyone, lighting, lighting, Pew Alto is higher. I mean, if, if the man asks for the light to be higher, Pew Alto. <laughs> and it was, like, there was like no language on set. It was like a, a mixture of every conceivable language that anyone had with, with some other verbs thrown in. It was very weird. And lots of sign language and throwing people in drawing diagrams in the dust. Or hand, a staple, yeah. hammer, oh, lots of things. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was actually a whole lot of fun. Sorry, there were some hands up there. Sir. How did you get the location for the truck stop, and how much damage did you actually do to the place? That's a good the, the, the location for the truck stop, it was an open, there was nothing there. There was nothing there. So no, it, was it was an empty lot, and it was, I think, uh, it was an empty lot. Yeah. And there was a fastener thing there. By the way, we had to blow up the truck stop twice. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because these effects guys were not very good at much, and they were certainly not very good at blowing up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> great blow up stuff to see afterwards was done by someone else. Actually, they did too well because they damaged the. the oh, yeah, they moved one of the buildings <laughs> off its foundation. <laughs> but if you're blowing something up at night, which they did. Uh, you want to make sure that you can actually see it, which is to say you, you put lots of explosives and you fill it with big open pans of gasoline so when it blows up you get this huge fireball. They did not realize that. They just filled the place with explosives. <laughs> and no, nothing that was going to give you a, a flame or a, or yeah. nothing. It doesn't give you any flame. Yeah, there was just thermite. It was like this flash bro. So okay. you're literally... All right, this is All Things A's with Garrett, and I'm Garrett. Uh, I got my good friend Chris Turner with me today. Chris is from the Midnight Movie Snap Podcast. This is with Chris and Garrett, and this is kind of a joint collaboration. Um, I figured at the end we just... So here's what happened. Um, you've, you're watching the video here, and all of a sudden it cuts off and it comes to us. What happened is I was in Wilmington, as, as you can tell from the video already, and I was filming the Q&A with Jock Brandis, and I apologize. I think I called him Jack Brandis a couple of times at the very beginning of the video. Yeah. I was not reading things properly. I was, so I apologize. It's Jock Brandis, and you can tell he's hilarious. But, it, but my video, but my memory ran out on my camera, and it cut off. So instead of me just talking to you guys directly to the camera like this, I'm going to talk to Chris, and it kind of mm -hmm. gives you an idea about, so Chris and I do this podcast, 
and it's called the Midnight Movie Snap Podcast. And we talk about movies usually. We usually watch movies and we kind of do a commentary as we, as we go. You can get your own legally obtained copy and watch along with us. But we've also kind of like, I don't know, kind of shifted away a little bit in the fact of going that we do that. But we're also going to just do like a regular podcast and just talking about movies and actors and different things. And we're actually going to talk about Bill Paxton in a little bit. But I wanted to finish up this part of the of the video with uh, with Jock Brandis and the Maximum Overdrive stuff. So there's a few more questions left on the uh, left in the Q and A, and I just want to and I just want to talk to Chris about it. And because because I know because because Chris was with me when we when I did the um, when I did the did the filming location for Maximum Overdrive videos that I did on YouTube, and he was there, and we talked and we did a little segment even right there at the Dixie Boy. That's right. And, and when we talked about it, so, um, you know, like, yeah, I mean, like that was a fun experience. A movie commentary. You went down? We also did a movie commentary. Oh, and we did them. Yeah, you definitely check out the movie commentary for for Maximum Overdrive. It was, I thought it was good. I mean, yeah. I mean, we're biased, obviously, but, okay. no, uh, but at the same time, it's like going, if you really, if you really want to, if you got two guys from North Carolina who, who, who are into movies and into the whole Wilmington scene and about, uh, you know, Dino De Laurentiis and yes. all the all the fun of there. It's I think it's a good listen. I mean, so yeah. I would just mention if if anybody wants to check it out, but they're not sure which episode it is. Episode 22. Episode 22. Another thing that we that we've done and, and I don't I don't think we've we, we have released it yet, but it's coming. So maybe this will be like a yeah, be, be a little advertising for you. Yeah, yeah. We talked with. We talked with Barry Bell, mm-hmm. who played Steve, the mechanic in Maximum Overdrive. Yep. And Chris, I'll let you tell the story a little bit. You can give a little backstory about how yeah. you know Barry and his wife. And you can tell a little bit about that before yeah. we get totally going into this. Yeah. So uh, Barry's wife, Lori Lindbergh, uh, was one of my teachers, one of my professors in college. And uh, she's also a professional actress like Barry or actor like Barry. And uh, I got to know Barry through her uh, and some of the productions that we did uh, at the college that I went to. And I actually wound up spending a summer uh, doing summer repertory theater with Barry. Um, Lori wasn't involved in any of those, but she came and visited quite often because we were up in the mountains of Burnsville. This was back in the late eighties. So this was after Barry had done Maximum Overdrive. And I remember very fondly uh, when we would be in between shows, we'd be in the, uh, the dressing room and just kind of talking about his experiences because, you know, he was one of the first professional actors I had ever really gotten to know both he and Lori and they're just wonderful people. And he had some great stories. And so uh, I reconnected with them um, a while back and, and asked them if they would be willing to jump on a call with us and, and talk about his experiences with maximum overdrive, as well as, Lori's experiences with some other movies uh, that we've we've covered, um, hiding out with John Cryer and um, Weekend at Bernie's uh, with Jonathan Silverman and uh, Andrew McCarthy. So uh, that we recorded an interview with them and they were just absolutely wonderful, um, even more wonderful than I remembered from my college days. So we uh, we're going to be uh, rolling that out. And I think it will probably be coming out right about the time we release our movie commentary on hiding out. Which Laura okay. is that'll be like early November, probably right. somewhere right. around that time frame. Yep. yep. Cool. Yeah, I mean, like, and they were great to talk to. Mm-hmm. I was, I mean, you had seen mm-hmm. like I've I said this, I think, after the after our, our interview with them, but but like you had sung their praises before. And, and and a lot of times, you know, like when you know people and you talk yeah. about them and you and you know, you, and you're like, well, you know, and you say, Oh, they're great to people mm-hmm. and you people go yeah yeah they're great and it's like but then you meet him you're going well you know i mean obviously you know he knows <laughs> right. him better and you know he has his connection so, so that's why they're really great to him well, but i'm like i nice. went like they were great i was like yeah. i was totally i was sold like the first two minutes i was like okay yeah. this is going to be really good they are they're such good people i mean i 
I, uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of the times when you're working with actors and creative folks, you know, they'll throw around, Oh, I love you. You know, like, Oh, I love them. They're, you know, they throw it around a lot, but I sincerely love those two people because they're just, they're so kind and they're so generous with their time. I mean, they really gave us more time than, I mean, I was totally expecting like we get 30 minutes, but we actually wound up having a lot more time with them to talk. Um, But they're also, in addition to being professional actors, although I think Barry has since retired, um, but uh, they teach acting and uh, they are phenomenal teachers. I think anybody who gets to study with them is extremely um, fortunate. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not even at your, but I kind of get, I get the same sense that they would be. Yeah, well, they're great. That would be absolutely awesome. great. So as we go, okay, so here, John Brandis was talking, and I told you, just got through saying, my camera, I ran out of space, I ran out of memory, and it cut off on me. So I was like, I mean, not battery, it's space. And I was like, and, and that's my own fault. I should have, I should have freed up more space before I went. I should have realized how good this is going to be. Happens, uh, I mean, it's yeah, like, so you, know, it's, you uh, always expect something like that. Right. Now. It's an amateur move on my part. So, you know, going forward, I've, I've, you know, it's a pro tip now. It's like I will have more space. <laughs> but one of the questions that was that was being answered, and I think I'll try to finish it up, What I'll try to remember what they said and a couple a couple more questions that were asked. And I, and I think they were pretty good. That's why I want to I want to let the viewer who was not there. I know you were you were thinking about coming. You couldn't come. Right. Uh, so it's like so 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 I kind of wanted to record this so just for anybody else who who was not able to come to the show when um, they would be able to you know like to hear but the, but the, one of the questions was about the about the Dixie boy and was it real and did it and did they did they actually blow it up which I think everybody who watched the movie kind of goes yeah they blew it up whatever I think that's right. how the question went but 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 what he but what he said that kind of like shot me right off the bat was he says not only did we blow it up we you know we blew it up twice and I was like okay. So he was, he had talked about earlier in the, you know, like in a couple of the questions that just what a, I don't know, a hodgepodge of people who worked on this. You had a lot, you, they, they hired these, the people who supposedly were like, um, who, who ran the special effects that really had no, no experience. I think they must have lied on their application <laughs> and it just it it really was just bad i mean so like they were talking about how they were flying by the seat of their pants and you know and uh i mean just wasn't you know just wasn't good so what they did like you know like he was explaining it and i'll and you can who was watching the video just just saw it so but basically like they blew it up but like like they didn't add any of the things that you would add to give it the like yeah it blew up but it didn't have like the you know like the like the flash of Right, fire and all that it's stuff that you need. Clouds of flame. Right, yeah, you just like yeah. you know that that, that ball, whatever of yeah, different yeah. stuff. So, so like they had to redo it again, which wow. I'm like, and I don't think you really answered the question. Like, like I wondered, and I should have asked that question myself. Is like, did they did they redo the the front for, for a facade and then yeah. from the backside, you know, blow it up one more time and just so the front? I don't know. Um, yeah. But he, I mean, he was just saying how they how they had to like blow it up. Um, yeah, I, I imagine if, if, uh, you know, that first time they didn't, they didn't do it right. I think probably just, um, I've, I worked on a movie that had some pyrotechnics in it. Um, and there was one situation where for whatever reason, the camera, like it didn't get the explosion. It didn't turn out the way they wanted it to. And so they, really just kind of they instead of like taking time to like rebuild it to back back to what it was they just kind of got it to a place where okay it kind of resembles what it looked like before but it's very you know like it's right you know it's just there to to be for that one second you see it before it blows up and and the other thing was that they moved the camera so it was like from a different camera angle so they were able to the editor was able to cut back and forth between the two shots gotcha. so between the two of them you got the sense that oh yeah this thing really blew up and when it blows up at night I and mean, that's the two you know that's it well i mean because it was a nighttime when they blew that thing up so it wasn't it wasn't a matter of like daytime where right. every little every little thing was you know and yeah. it's and, and you're thinking about 1980 Six eighty five when this is filmed. I mean yeah. that it you know you know we don't have the you know like at the time like you don't you don't see all the 
all the nuances when you're watching it, you know, on a VCR tape that you do now when you're looking at a H, you know, HD, all the right. high. Well, I got to say, you know, that bit of news, I was surprised when you told me that, that they had to do it twice because just from when we watched it a, a few weeks ago for our commentary, I was impressed with that explosion. Like it was, you know, um, so second time was the charm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, you know, like I said, the film I worked on where we blew a bunch of stuff up, what you don't realize, you know, cause you're watching it, you're just seeing it. But when you blow stuff up, you know, it, the, the, the blast of air and the heat that comes off of it, because most productions, they use this stuff. I, I think it's called naphthalene. It's like a gel of some kind that at least I think that's what it is, but it's very, you know, combustible. It really gives off a big explosion, but it gives off a tremendous amount of heat. And so I remember when we were watching that commentary, thinking how big that explosion was. I was bet I bet you that singed the hair off of the cameraman because uh, you you feel it. I mean, you could be outside of the the blast zone as they call it, right? Still feel like, uh, you know, not to get off the subject here, but like the movie that I worked on when they blew up, uh, it was basically two gas pumps just two little gas pumps. They blew those up and I was standing several hundred yards away from it when they detonated. And I was kind of in an alley um, there in this downtown area and the, the air, like the blast of air and the heat, it actually pushed me up against the wall. I mean, it was probably, you know, pushed me like six inches, but it, it knocked me back a little. Um, and you just were like, wow, you just don't realize it until you're you're right there witnessing it. But that ran through my mind when we were watching the Dixie Boy blow up in the movie. You probably about memories. So you yeah. like you did those. Yeah. <laughs> like some somebody got knocked over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It <laughs> was a huge explosion. It but was. Yeah, I mean, that was the charm, like you said, because I, I mean, it turned out pretty good. I thought it, I think so. I think it turned. Yeah. I mean, so it's but it sounded like there was a lot of. And that's going to be the last question that was that was asked, and I will get to that one. But the second question that was that was not, or maybe the first question that's technically not on that I, that was not on video that I didn't get was is a question that you asked Barry Bell. You asked Barry the question, and what was the question you asked Barry that uh, there was a there was a rumor floating around for years that um, even though Stephen King is listed as the director of this movie. And there was marketing where he talked about he had directed this movie. There was a rumor that uh, director George Romero, who's best known for Night of the Living Dead, he did Creep Show with Stephen King a couple of years before Maximum Overdrive. He visited King while King was down there filming. And there was a rumor that he actually took over and shot parts of Maximum Overdrive. And you know, in the interview with Barry, he said he didn't recall ever, you know, seeing Romero actually directing. Um, but then again, he admitted, I believe, if I remember correctly, Barry said, you know, he wasn't in all of the scenes. So it is right. possible it could have that could have happened. Um, I think King has never said anything one way or the other. Um, but I do think, you know, there was something else that I believe Barry said or something that I read that uh, it is probable that. Romero being there, King probably asked for his advice. But there are some movie buffs who, in watching the movie, uh, there are certain scenes where they swear it's like that's the George Romero shot, like the way the camera's positioned, or you know, the way there's some element of it that people have said that's George Romero right there. And I guess you know, it's true, like directors do have certain techniques, you know, it's kind of like almost like fingerprints, you know, you can kind of look right. at a movie and tell, oh yeah, that's a Spielberg or that's a, you know, um, any other director out there, you know, it's kind of like they, they have these signature uh, camera techniques that they employ. And uh, so there are some film buffs who say that there are scenes in Maximum Overdrive that just look like they have Romero's fingerprints all over them. Well, that's funny you said that because I was I just got through and I'm not I wasn't going to bring this up, but I've, I will bring it up since we, since this, it, this really does apply. But I just got through doing some film location stuff for for Silver Bullet, yeah. um, you know, the another Stephen King movie and which came before Maximum Overdrive. Right. But uh, what's what was, you know, like what I noticed from watching the movie, I mean, and watching both, I've seen both movies just recently is that you could tell that in 
Armando, which is going to be our, be the next question, uh, a question by him. But you could tell that he 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 did the he did the filmography. What do you how do you, how do you say it? cinematography? Cinematography. Yeah, huh? he's the director of cinematography. Cinematography. He did cinematography on that film, and there are things in both movies that I go, oh my gosh, it's like you could tell that's that's his that's that's him. I mean, it's Absolutely. the way. He, it's like there's a couple there's a couple and I made I made reference to this but like it's like from within the vehicle he he has this like the camera from within look at looking out of the like out of a, like a car or a truck looking out the window like he's inside mm-hmm. he's looked it out you can like, like they had that you know quite a few times in Maximo Drive like they had like the like the the camera inside the truck looking out the window as like I remember like Kurt and Connie going out you know like after the kicking mule or the truck stop that they were first were at. And it goes by, and you could see just looking out a couple of times outside of the um, outside the Green Goblin. You can see you can see from inside the truck looking out at um, at you know like at Emilio um, out there. Well, he did the same thing in Silver Bullet, and then there's a couple of times. Oh, and then I could tell with um, and there's a couple of times where he, he he obviously had the I don't know what you call it by then, but I guess it was it a crane that they used to go up mm-hmm. like like when they get a like a like yeah, a camera uh, crane, huh? A camera crane. A camera crane. Well, it, I mean, like now you could use a you can use a drone to get those shots, mm-hmm. but yeah. at the time it's like. But he he had a, he had a couple of those where like it's on the corner the corner pictures of the corner lot of the of the Dixie Boy location. You know, he went up, and you could tell it was uh, way up in the air, and he and then it was one looking back down the uh, down seventy four seventy six mm-hmm. when the when the uh, when the bulldozer was coming. Um, and stuff. It was, it was the same way. Well, he did the same thing in Silver Bullet. It's like he, there's a there's a downtown shot of Burgall, and he's in in. Well, it's actually two. There's two downtown shots of Burgall. That he's up really high on that thing, and one's at night, one's at daytime. And I was like, these are like, I never would have even caught that if it wasn't the fact of of watching both those movies almost kind of like, I mean, almost back to back. I mean, pick up little cues, pick you know, up like, cues on stuff. So yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's. Um, so yeah, I think there there are people who say about Maximum Overdrive that George Romero those look like George Romero shots, and George um, he was kind of a movie making jack of all trades. I mean, he he started out doing a lot of low budget indie filmmaking. Of course, like Night of the Living Dead was a low budget production, and you know he had a very small production outfit. He did a lot of the stuff. I think he operated the camera for that movie and i believe you know he i think some movies he did have director of photographies or you know or cinematographers um but he i think he was a cameraman and so i think he definitely would do a lot of his own camera work for his films and um yeah i mean i i've i'm a fan of romero's i've seen a lot of his movies um you know i having seen maximum overdrive when we watched it for the commentary uh i was kind of keeping an eye out for it i didn't see anything that stood out to me as like oh yeah that looks like romero um it would have to be one i probably would have to go back and like really watch it more carefully but nothing stood out to me kind of like what you described with armando with silver bullet and maximum overdrive i mean you immediately picked up on those things i didn't with Maximum Overdrive in Romero's work. I just didn't right. see it. You didn't see it. You know, didn't see it. So I feel it. Well, that's so, what Jock, I mean, so I answer the question now is like, you know, like Jock said, no, he said there was, you know, he didn't. And there's another guy who was, and I need, I, I need to go back and listen to the video again. Um, he was over to the side. He, he, he spoke a couple of times. He, and, they, and he ended up saying that he was, he worked on the film and he said that he was, he was Dino's brother-in-law. So I don't know if he was Martha's, he was Martha's brother or there was another how like another connection or how he was the brother-in-law right. but he said he was Dino's brother-in-law for a while so I don't know um, uh, I think just I was kind of wrapping up on just saying um that watching a maximum overdrive and you know being a fan of George Romero's work um I didn't see anything that stood out to me as oh that's a George Romero move Right. Uh, what I think is it, it is, I mean, I think it's been confirmed that he did visit Wilmington when King was down there shooting. What I suspect is that King, you know, talked with George and said, hey, 
how do I do this? You know, oh. that's what I totally expect because, you know, King had never directed. He'd never done anything with film. He just, you know, he's, he'd written books and he had written some screenplays. Um, and, you know, he had a pretty, from what I understand, had a very, you know, good relationship with George Romero. They worked on Creep Show together. That's and, so cool. uh, and, and so I, I fully expect that if there's anything in there that somebody would go, that looks like Romero. I think it's just him saying, Steve, you ought to do it this way. And so he just followed what George right. told. Him. So that's 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 my if, if there's anything involved with Romero, that's what I think uh, is, is like more likely than him pushing, you know, saying, Steve, why don't you go to your trailer? I'll get yeah, I'll take over. You know, I'll shoot this for you. No, I I, I don't, you know, and, and I've seen a lot of interviews with Romero. He doesn't strike me as the kind of person who would do that. I mean, even if Steve and King had said, George, direct this for me, he would have been like, Steve, this is yours. Like, like I'll tell you what you need to yeah. do, but this is your movie. Um, that 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 just what I know of Romero, that I think that would have probably been his uh his um his response. But you know, Romero passed away uh, a couple of years ago. And his wife uh, is in the process of like kind of gathering all of his papers and all of the projects that he had been working on. And I think it's either Carnegie Mellon, which is up in Pittsburgh, where he's from, uh, they're like going to house all of his you know, materials. And there was even a movie that like a kind of forgotten movie that he had done years ago that recently saw light of day because of the work that his wife is doing to kind of preserve his cool his stuff. So, you know, maybe one day down the road, we'll actually get a chance to talk to her and we could ask her like, is there anything in his, you know, yeah. papers or any is, you know, journals that made reference to this, but uh, anyway, that's for another that, time. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I mean, do you mean, I mean, you know, I mean, we love to dig and see if we can find uh, information. I'd love to, yeah. that'd be great. We can hear one of the things that um, I just remember another question that was before we get to the Armando um, to the how he lost his eye to the to Lamore scene. That was that was the that was the next question. One question was like it was mentioned several times that Jock mentioned that Stephen Stephen King's and his and and Dino's you know relationship had really had came like this and yeah. it started out like a five picture deal i think what it was originally was and yeah. so um and i think what four of those were filmed in wilmington mm -hmm. so while garrett is uh, working through his technical difficulties um just talking about george romero and garrett feel free to edit this out i'm just kind of talking until you join us again um that's definitely a filmmaker that uh, I think we will eventually cover at some point on uh, the Midnight Movie Snack podcast. Um, he is, uh, in a lot of ways, a pioneer. I mean, when you think about the predominance of zombie movies and television shows, uh, that has Romero all over it. I mean, he originated the flesh-eating zombie horror movie with night of the living dead and then dawn of the dead and then uh day of the dead or the original trilogy all right hey there so i just put some filler in there about george romero feel free to edit it out oh no that's great hope it hope it hope it took i mean i hope it'd be great i'm sorry this all right i'm gonna try to i'm gonna try to finish this up as quickly as possible so okay. we get we, what i'm gonna probably do when we get back on to talk about bill paxton i'm gonna probably yeah. get on my phone or something or the okay. tablet okay we'll, finish yeah so sounds good um so let's see so yeah he said it was a five picture deal and mm -hmm. by the time and it was supposedly sound like a good idea to have steven direct for the first time and it was kind of going to be i think dino wanted that i think he's gonna you know like it was you know it's kind of was going to be a i think a pr thing too probably oh, absolutely yeah all of that was going to be so it was huge king was like a mega i mean his books right movies made from him I mean, I think it was a pure PR move. Right. Like he's going to direct this one, you know? Exactly. So, but I think at the beginning, the relationship was obviously much better. I think yeah. by the time they got to this movie, they were, you know, I think they had had enough of each other. And, yeah. 
and, and they even said that like, Dino was a you know he was a peculiar fella anyway. It's like it's, was. there was there was good and there was bad, and I think you got to take the good with the bad. And you yeah, know, I mean, well, you know, with a lot of people are that way, but it seemed to be like maybe a little bit more. And I and I think the story I'm going to tell next about Armando probably leads to that. But you know, yeah. I think I mean I think him and Stephen, like I said, butted heads, and that was. Yeah. Um, even though Stephen didn't know the first thing about directing, but he will tell you he didn't know the first thing about directing. So there you go. At least Dino had made movies before. So, you know, what did he have to, I mean, what's his excuse? I don't know. There, there we go. But I mean, I, I mean, not bad mouth of Dino. Cause I think, I mean, he's done a lot for North Carolina. I think by him doing Firestarter, we owe. He got the ball rolling. He got the ball rolling, man. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think it was Jim Hunt. Was he the governor at the time? Yes, he was. Yes. I mean, so you got to, and I got to give Jim Hunt, we got to give Jim Hunt some credit there too, because mm-hmm. I've, I read the stories about them like, like flying around in a helicopter or airplane or something, looking yeah. at, looking at areas and, and that kind of really got, got yeah. them on board about building the North Carolina film studio. Oh yeah. Which became the, you know, the. Yeah. I mean, Hunt definitely was uh, just in some ways just as visionary as Dino De Laurentiis in that he saw that this state could be a major state for film production. And I think he definitely was proven right. Yes. And would still be proven right, you know, if things hadn't have changed like it did in the past few years. Oh, with the, I mean, I mean, you know, the tax incentives, and I hate, you know, I don't, and I don't try to blame anybody for this, but it's like, you could tell what, you know, Georgia profit, profited hugely. Oh, yeah. For, for us, for us as a state, yeah. not not doing stuff. Yeah. Well, there was there's a whole consp- I don't know if it's conspiracy or if it's actually true, but there's like apparently a whole behind the scenes story that's not just North Carolina's film commission or the governor or any of that stuff. Like some people want to delay it at um, uh, McCrory's feet for. Right. That's not okay. But either. I don't think. There was more to it, and and it's interesting because the story actually involves Chick Fil A. Apparently, well, that's for another time. Hmm. Um, we'll talk about that. I'd be a good one to talk yeah. about. We need to bring that yeah. up. Oh no! <laughs> oh boy, we're never going to get through this. <laughs> My gosh! <laughs> it's like I'm getting like every one or two words, and it's like. <laughs> It's like a really bad Mad Libs. I can't, I can't figure out what to put in the blank. <laughs> yeah, but I, you're, I can see you find the video seems good. Fine. Good. Yeah. Okay. So the last question, and we'll wrap this. This, this is it. The last question was about what happened with the, uh, you know, with the lawnmower scene about Armando and what happened. So they said that it had like a very happy set very loose and probably too loose and you know and i've heard i've heard yearly smith talk about things that she probably said this you know she shouldn't have been you know she was in front of the camera or front of the truck way too long when it was coming through the coming through the thing there's a lot of stuff that probably just didn't should not have happened yeah probably in in that but one of the things they mentioned that jock mentioned mentions earlier is that they had this. They had this crew of special effects people that didn't know what the heck they were doing. They were they were really not qualified, and so they had rigged up. So they used a real lawnmower with a real lawnmower blade, and the, the this other guy says that they could have used like a nylon whip that would have gave the same effect and not have and not have had a real blade under the under the thing. Right. They they were they. They had the camera down low because because remember it's kind of like showing the showing it from like the right beside the the lawnmower. Yeah. The 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 lawnmower was the only thing I think the only thing in the movie that was actually radio controlled. Okay. So you're thinking about these guys who are like the special effects crew. <laughs> don't know what they're doing. These so the so the so the lawnmower is radio controlled and it's it's not going where it's supposed to go. So that's yeah. there's the one. So they got this got the camera with these wood wedges propped up on the like to get to kind of get the camera at the, at the right angle that it needs to be at whatever right so so the scene happens of course the radio you can you can see where this is going because we all know kind of we know where it's going but the but the lot but the lawnmower goes in the wrong direction goes toward the camera S- somebody else jumps in the way and grabs the camera because they don't want the camera to be to, to be messed up 
Yeah, God forbid the camera get, you know. Right. I mean, it's, it's kind of it too. But what happened is the, yeah, they're the camera. Yeah. yeah. So, so when the camera gets picked up, the, there's these wood wedges. The lawnmower goes over them. You know, it hits it hits them. Stuff shoots, you know, shoots out and it yeah. hits Romero. And it, and it happens to hit, our, I mean, Romero, I'm, gosh, I'm talking about Armando. Armando. Yeah. And his, and his, and his filming eye. I mean, that's, that's what's horrible. I can just add something there that, you know, so when uh, that happened, Nanuzzi or Armando, the last name's Nanuzzi, um, he sued Stephen King. And it says that he sued 17 other people on the production. So I imagine of those 17, a number of them were probably special effects folks, but he apparently sued all of them for $18 million in damages, which $18 million back in 1987. I mean, that's, that's a lot. And it's, you know, understandable. I mean, this was his livelihood. And like you said, it, his right eye is the eye he was using to, you know, do his job. And, you know, before these movies, I mean, he, he had had a, you know, pretty long career as a, as a camera operator and as a cinematographer. Uh, it says that the suit was settled out of court. So who knows how much he, he managed to, to get, um, Hopefully it was enough. Um, I mean, he did a few films after this one. Uh, in fact, I think he did two more films, uh, two films in the 90s, and then he passed away in uh, 2001. By the time Maximum Overdrive rolled around, uh, he was in his 60s, early 60s when it happened. So I imagine he was a seasoned uh, camera operator and cinematographer. The information. Gotcha. Well, the thing. Okay. The, okay. So he lost his. He lost his. His. His film and I. And so, like that changed the whole mood on set. And that really, they said that happened early in the film. That like that scene wow. was early. And King or Adino was advised. Even though he had worked, he had known him for a long, long time. Worked with a lot of stuff. But he was advised that in America, what you do, because he was told that he was going to be sued. And he was told that what you do to to uh, to avoid whatever or to, 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 to kind of draw it out in the court was to sue first. So he sued he sued Armando first. <laughs> and, and and I think that that. They said that's what severed their relationship. Oh wow! Well, was because because I think you know it's like yeah it was it was bad what happened, it was horrible what happened, but that made it worse when you're you know like when you're a good friend, you're you know been a partner yeah. for a long time, you know he you know like that happens to you and then he sees you like he's still in the hospital, yeah he's still in the hospital and he's getting sued. I mean this is this is crazy stuff, man. I mean and so and for that. You know, like I think that gives Dino a really bad light. Mm-hmm. I don't. I can see it was really bad advice for whoever gave that to him. Yeah. And I think it's like, and it's something. Somebody they on the special effects team, <laughs> right? Exactly. And and oh, that's it too. They didn't fire the special effects thing people because that would have shown, and again, more bad advice because that would have shown, like, you know, like negligence on their part. Uh-huh. Like he was admitting negligence or a bad or a bad work environment or whatever. And so, like, they kept those jokers around. That's what they said. And it was just like, so, man, that was just, uh, that was bad news. But I wonder if any uh, of those special effects folks worked on The Crow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's, mo- I bad. mean, most likely. I mean, mm-hmm. oh, my gosh, it's, it's it's something to look into. But, mm-hmm. all right, that's that's been fun. Uh, we're going to finish this. We're going to sign off here. It's been, a, I, I want to appreciate uh, Chris uh, helping on this. Check Thanks out the Midnight Movie Snack podcast. Check out the Maximum Overdrive episode. Uh, we, we got yep. one several bullet coming out. Uh, yep. You will. I, I think they'll like. You'll like some other episodes that we have done. But also, um, we got the Bill Paxson and and also the Barry Bell uh, one coming out in in November as well. I think you'll enjoy that one. Yep. So thanks again, and I'm we're signing out. All right. <laughs>